Okay, everybody, welcome back to Organic Chemistry. Now let's do the second section of the Chapter 13, Part 1. Now, what we're going to talk about next is about determining the stability of a conjugated system. And it, we got to kind of work on some of the details from last semester, kind of uh, remind ourselves about some of these ideas about uh, measuring stability in systems and, and how we can actually do that. Now, so if you remember from last semester, there are two ways that we could measure the stability of a system. They both involve measuring heat released after you do something to a molecule. So if we have molecule A and we were to do some sort of procedure to it, which would make it into something new, let's say B plus heat, well, we could determine the amount of heat and that would help us to figure out how stable or unstable A is, okay? Because the amount of heat released is a direct indicator of how unstable or stable A is, okay? The rule was the more heat released equals less stable for A. Okay, so that we that's how we figure out how stable or unstable something is. We just kind of measure the heat that's being released. Now remember, there are two ways that we can do this. So there are two ways that we can do this. The first one is heat, or let, let's actually do the one that we're not going to use right now. So the first one is heat of combustion. And this is useful when you have molecules that are not, but usually we're doing a comparison between two different molecules. So if you have molecule A and B, and I ask you which is more stable, then you could go through heat of combustion and figure out which one releases more heat. So for example, if I have, let's say, a four carbon system like this, or let's say, a, a, yeah, that's fine. And, and then let's say a carbon system like that, they're both four carbons, uh, but, the thing is that in order for us to figure out which is more stable, we would have to go through a process like heat of combustion, where we use some sort of oxidation, and we're basically going to burn the molecules. We're going to burn them up. And what we want to making after we burn them is a whole bunch of CO2s. We have CO2 for both of them, right? They become CO2s a whole bunch of times. And in our case, we're going to have a total of one, two, three, four CO2s, right? Because there are four carbons in both examples, plus we have heat. Now, that heat, like I said, is a measure of how unstable or stable the beginning stuff is. So we destroy our molecule, but we can capture the amount of heat that's being released. And then if we divide that by the number of carbons then that'll give us the heat per carbon, the heat per carbon, right? Or CH3 or CH2, it depends on the carbon structure. So the heat per carbon would be provided. And then we could figure out which one released more heat, right? So the greater, or actually there's two ways to look at it. We can have, if we look at the sign, like let's say we have a negative 120 for let's say molecule A versus molecule B, right? So if this is negative 120, I'm just making up numbers. And let's say this is negative uh, 100, okay? So if this is molecule A and this is molecule B, the way that we would figure this out is we would say that either it's a smaller number with the sign included, right? Or you could just ignore the sign, think of it as loss of, and look at the number itself. So the bigger number without considering the sign is going to be the one that releases more heat. Okay, but with the sign, it's actually the smaller number, right? So what we would say is that this is losing 120 kilojoules per mole. That's the, the units, as opposed to B, which only loses 100 kilojoules per mole. So if I ask you which is more stable, A or B, remember, the one that releases more heat 
is less stable. So in our case, A is less stable than B. This tells me that A is less stable than B. Okay, that's what these numbers tell me. All right, so we're looking at kilojoules per mole, and that's the the, the measurement unit, the measurement, and so that's what we're basically seeing here. So again, it's either the smaller negative number, or I, I should say, the, sorry, the larger negative number. Um, actually, it works out either way, right? So, um, no, 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 sorry, I'm saying it backwards. The smaller negative number, or just look at the number and ignore the sign, 120 is more heat being released than 100, okay? So what does that tell me? So that tells me that, and remember these key terms, potential energy. What potential energy tells us, it's the amount of energy stored in the molecule. Now remember how we determined potential energy from last semester. There are a few different measure, uh, things that will contribute to this. Right? So just as a quick reminder, things like uh, electron repulsion creates potential energy. When electrons are in an orbital and they sense each other, they repel each other, right? So that's increasing in potential energy. Another one was the geometry itself, like the bond angle. So bond angles will cause potential energy increases because, again, electrons will repel, have less area to travel. Uh, the nuclear repulsions, nuclear repulsion. So when the nuclei come close together between uh, bonds within an atom, within a molecule, uh, they're going to repel each other. So these are things that are going to cause potential energy um, within the system. And so the logic is, is that once you break apart your molecule, you've released them from all that molecular potential energy. And now they're back at the atomic or a smaller uh, subset from the bigger molecule. And so when you break bonds, you release the potential energy. Some molecules have more potential energy than others, and the heat is the indicator to help us figure that out. So this is one way to figure out the stability of a system. Now, it turns out that in conjugated systems, which is what we care about, so this is one way. But the second way, and the one that we're going to focus on, is heat of hydrogenation. Okay, so whenever you could use H2, like in alkenes or alkynes, that's the better way to go, right? So last semester, as a reminder, we were told last semester that if you have an alkene, then use H2, and let's say palladium, well, you're going to get an alkane plus heat, and again, we measure the heat. That heat will tell us how stable or unstable this alkene is compared to another alkene. And this is what we use to figure out that an alkene that has more substituents around it is more stable, right? So remember how we said that if you have an alkene like this compared to, an, say as an example, so an alkene like that compared to an alkene like this, let's say, when I use H2, um, well, actually, let's, let's put the same structure. So Because remember, you have to have the same structure, otherwise you do the combustion. If they don't become the same thing at the end, then it's not a good comparison. So you want it to become the same thing. So let's say a double bond like that. So at the end, they both become the exact same alkane, and that's very important. They must become the same thing when you do heat of hydrogenation. So they do become the same thing in my example, plus heat and plus heat. Now, if I ask you which one releases more heat, molecule A or B, you would tell me molecule B releases more heat. Now, how do you know that? Because remember the rule from last semester. We said when you look at an alkene, you can count up how many carbons are directly touching it outside of the alkene carbons. And so this has four R's, which means it's more stable than if it only has one, two R's, right? Two R's. And so we knew that the more carbons around an alkene, the more stable. And what does that mean? That means it's going to release less heat compared to the bottom one, which will re release more heat. How much? We don't care. But the point is, is that we know that the bottom number is going to be a larger number, right? So if we look at the magnitude, the, forget about the, the, the degree. If we look at the actual number, it'll be a larger number than the top number. 
Or if you look at the negative sign, then you could say that the 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 um, the bottom one. I confuse myself with this. The bottom one is going to be a smaller number with the negative sign than the top one.